And we're live. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks very much for joining me again tonight. Sorry about that. We had a wee bit of a uh, an issue there, which I'd forgot to set this live stream up from earlier. So apologies. And uh, I was just quickly tipper tappering away, and I'll fill in the details later. So um, thank you very much, everybody, for joining me. Um, if anybody's uh, just arriving there, um, that was the last episode we had. We have on the um, on the theme of evolution, and we end with the looking at the Duncan Idaho uh, final Duncan Idaho Gola, and <clears throat> excuse me, um, basically also presenting some of our conclusions there on on evolution. Heidi Babs, how's it going? Sorry about that, as I said, I forgot to set the thing up properly, so I had to do a quick bit of tipper tappering there. So I'm just saying hello until I think somebody's joined me. <laughs> so how's it going, Babs? I hope you're keeping well. Hello to everybody out there. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to get the, the precious fluids going. Um, I hope you've enjoyed tonight's episode. As I said, that's Duncan, the final Duncan Idaho Gola. And um, and he hit, he's the character that we hit all the cliffhangers with, I think. And we have so many questions with. And his interactions is we were just chatting about um, Babs, uh, you know, with, with Daniel and Marty and what is it that allows him to see. Uh, I'm not too bad, Babs. Thank you very much. I'm still bunged up very badly, but it's uh, <laughs> so we're take, oh, uh, taking decongestants. Decongestants. Um, <clears throat> so I just got a, and I just got a bolt of white noise through my brain there because I can hear white noise. Um, but <laughs> it's away now. But otherwise, no, I'm, I'm very, very good. Thank you very much. Um, mm. So I was just a bit chesty for the last week or so. <coughs> Excuse me, as you can tell. And um, yeah, it's just the weather here shifted quite badly. And uh, it's not too bad tonight. It's calmed down a wee bit, but the, it's you know sort of fast moving high winds and stuff. But it's been very stormy. I'm very wet, and, and just the air pressure is quite quite harsh here at the moment. But um, yeah, it's all a bit bunged up in this house, so I hope I don't sound too nasal. Um, but otherwise, I'm good, thank you. And um, yeah, so as usual, anybody's got any questions, comments? You were you were running with something there, I think, a second or two ago, uh, Babs. Keep drinking liquids uh, makes the uh, easier to cough up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, particularly the milk, I think. I'm a big milk drinker. Um but yeah, it's it's more just oh it's the it's all here and just in the in the in the pressure and the behind the head, you know. So it is there's quite bad air pressure. Well I we have a way for the same, we just, just feel it, but it's sitting right in front of the uh your head, if you know what I mean. So no, I'm fine, feeling fine. It's just feeling a bit bleh, bit bunged up and uh I'm sounding a bit nasal myself, but I, I have a bit of bother with how I sound. So uh, sometimes I can be quite shouty because of it, you know. Um, so there we go. But yeah, thank you very much for asking. I'm, I'm good. I hope you're all well. Um, if anybody's got any questions, the usual round table on um, fire them out on uh, the final Duncan Idaho Gola, on the last June books, on or any of the June books or June film or anything to do with science fiction at all. Um, so it's it's uh, Sunday night, 10 o'clock here. I don't know. How many of us will have sort of popping in, but getting ready for the beginning of a new week? But uh, yeah, so there's the Duncan, the final Duncan Idaho Gola. And you, were, as you were just talking about, thinking, Bab says, thinking that how Duncan saw outside the null shot, null ship. Um, you were thinking about what to co-locate, and I was thinking, ah, by location is is um one of the attributes as as you're going to find out. I was going to look at the videos you've already seen them, I think, Babs. But when we get into the hero chapter, it's one of those attributes of the Kwisatz Sadarak. Kwisatz Sadaraks have the ability to be, uh, you know, as much as um, the shortening of the way, but it's by location, the ability to be in two places at once, if you like. But sort of suggesting there that you were saying, thinking that how Duncan saw outside the null ship, how does he see Daniel and Marty? I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, uh, it's it's presented as whatever it is he is seeing his brain can't make sense of it. So, um, what we actually do see, so that, you know, the, the idea of the net, whatever that is, that's kind of a human construct in in uh, Duncan's mind. It's his way of looking at it. So, uh, but um, who who are Duncan and and, and uh, or sorry, who are Daniel and Marty? I think is is our big mystery at the at the end of. Um, Chapter House June, 
And um, what are they? <laughs> uh, where are they? When are they? I think there's there's several questions. Um, and of course, how can Duncan how can Duncan see them? How can they see Duncan? And um, you know, they they get a bit. Um, they're kind of sometimes they're amused. Some, they're observing him, and he's observing them, and it seems accidental. I suppose or a quality of um, quizzatory hatteracky, <laughs> that sort of nonsense. If you see what I mean, and we're having a bit of fun with those words, they are they. Um, but yeah, what what is it that Duncan's looking through? What is it? What is it that he's seeing through? What and is it? Some kind of network or something that allows him to actually see these people, and. Um, Again, we can maybe assume that their appearance and their look is something to do with how, again, his mind maybe can't interpret it. And so that, that's, that's like, again, Duncan, uh, Daniel and Marty could be a construct of, the, of Duncan's mind and presented to us uh, by Frank Herbert that way, so in, in a way that we can understand. I think, I think every time I talk about Duncan and Marty, I use the picture from American Gothic. Um, you know this famous picture, and I don't know what people think about me using that picture, but I've, I've, it, it makes sense to me in a wee way. Um, and uh, the description of the couple, I, I don't know. It, it reminds me very much of that. That's that's why I went with that picture. How do I represent Daniel and Marty? Is it just some any any old couple in a in a garden? Maybe not. You know, but. Uh, or, or that sort of thing. But um, that's why I went with that particular picture. So Bob says maybe the net was how he interpreted the null field. The danger they spoke of related to vision of this kind. Ah. Okay, yeah. So uh, or, I suppose arguably with the whole with the idea of prescience being like a network of things where, where there are no ships and stuff, it must be sort of a kind of mappable holes in the, <laughs> I would say, you know, that kind of thing. It sort of reminds you a bit on the map from the Time Bandits or something. Um, I always pictured Marty of being squat. Um, well, I can wonder how he is described there. We we had that description a wee bit, but uh, I don't know. There was a uh, there was a. I think there was a Star Trek episode where there was a couple very similar to the Next Generation. I'm thinking on very similar to Daniel and Marty. Um, Something about them living on a planet on their own or something. One of them, I think. I don't know. Can't remember. I think one of them was an alien. Um, I don't know. Well, I suppose I hadn't really put too much thought into it. Babs up until the point until I decided I need to, needed to get an image for them. But uh, just based on their their disc description and their text, you know, it's just a and it's a sort of isn't it like a kind of white picket fence garden type thing, you know. Um, Hmm. Oh, sorry. There's me being confused, isn't it? Marty's the female, isn't that right? Uh, <laughs> I was thinking. Sorry, I was thinking about you. What you were saying there, being squat, and I was thinking it's not talking about Daniel. Um, Daniel and Marty. Yeah. Um, I don't know. They're hard to get. A, they're they're a mystery, aren't they? I don't know what you guys think of them. Um, my other opinion. I think we've chatted about this. Was I think I said that it was a bit, uh, how do we put it? It was a bit similar. It could be that kind of solipsistic moment, I suppose, uh, or that, that moment of realization that I, I, there is a the part of me that thinks um, Daniel and Marty are um, uh, Frank and Bev, you know. But it's possible, you know, with, with both of their health. Being it wasn't that way. I, it's possible that maybe I don't know. Maybe Frank. I know that. I think the conditions of his was. I think didn't he die off during surgery or something? I think. Um, but I, you know, I think um, I understand that Bev's health was not well for a long time. I think so. I don't know. There's a sense of maybe. And I think didn't Bev ask Frank this? You know that 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 dedication at the end of that book. I think. Um, but the, there's a possible sense that maybe Frank. Did know that he wasn't going to finish it. I don't know. If, I don't. Know, I've not really heard people consider this. Um, yes, indeed. Yin, another scissorgy yin yang Janice image, male female pairing. Yeah. 
Um, it's questions. What are they? Uh, and we can, you know, we had a wee bit of insight there. We were chatting, but I suppose with with the way we've looked at evolution throughout this bit of the series, that each each episode. I mean, there's different ways. We'll be looking at some of these characters again in a different way, but the whole point was to stick to how things evolve and different, um, diff through the different, at this point, the, the quiz at Sadarax I mean, a good way of looking at evolution, you know. Um, and, of course, we, the, the other memory that, that uh, sorry, I had a thread of thought there for a wee second there. Yeah, we get. Oh, it was that we sort of get hints of what that possibly something through, through Miles Tegg and his kind of crisis point, don't we? So there, there's there's other sort of glances at whatever this is is. It's what's going on, and um, something about possibly if it's got to do with Duncan Idaho, and his other memory is personal, and goes all the way back to you know the original Duncan Idaho. Oh, is, there's an interesting question. I suppose does it end there, or do we, you know, would it, his other memory extend back into the male line, you know, to his own parents, for example, or his own father? Um, it's, it, there's wee sort of things that aren't answered about it again, and um, it, it's simply think and think in terms of other memory. Or Daniel and Marty, I get sense of either something from the. Uh, it's tricky. Is it outside of time? Or possibly either future or past, but there, there's a time element involved. I think I don't know what you, what you think, Babs, but I think there's a time element involved with whatever this net is, um, and that the, the this yes this um, how maybe you say earlier maybe net was how you interpreted the Nulfus, but the danger that they spoke of related to the vision of this kind. So you get the sense that Duncan that there's real danger with him, personal danger to him. I think um, from looking at these two. Uh, um, you wonder what, what what's the danger in that sense? What could it be? And if you think about when other people with the, ah, okay, here's a way. I've just thought about this. I think maybe if if you think about the way we think of other memory and the the process Jessica has to go through to become a reverend mother, um, and you know, for example, whenever we get to look at the Bene Gesserit view of other memory and that place that's terrifying that they can't look at. And, you know, we find that that's the male line. The, the Kwisatz Haderach has been bred for the whole idea that the, whenever then the Bene Gesserit look to that place, they'll see the Kwisatz Saderach staring back at them, representing the male line. Um, but what would you have with Duncan Idaho? And you have, you have the question becomes then, is, is Paul, for example, aware of the, the female line too? Um, or would he see uh, would he see a terrible a, a blackness, a gap where the female other memory goes? And so that becomes my question. Is what what do you think about this, Bob? Is what Daniel's looking at peeking through at um, Daniel and Marty, is that the equivalent of that? that place where you should not look, if you see what I mean. And something to do with him looking into, maybe he's not be. you see what I'm trying to say? Maybe he shouldn't be able to look through there and there is danger to him, but he can. So maybe it's that kind of black spot and blank spot in the, in the kind of either other memory or prescience. But all he can see is these two people in a garden and it makes you wonder. Um, just a sort of a, an opinion of, of, that it could be that kind of thing. You're, talk, you're talking also about also with the null technology and the, the no technology null fields and stuff as well, and the, what how they hide things from from prescience and so on. Um, goodness, you could come up with all sorts of ideas with this. So maybe maybe there are a couple at the end of time who've passed Kralizek. Maybe there are a couple who are. At the, is it that how does Brian do Brian Herbert run and Kevin J Anderson run with it that they're they're AIs I think. Um, it's interesting you can really play with it you know I don't know what you guys think. Um, Marty's female shorter and curvy says Babs. Yeah and Daniel's the male yeah. Um, another syzygy yin yang Janice image absolutely. I mean, honestly we have that kind of same thing with 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 Duncan and Miles the the old young and the teacher pupil, 
and you know that, that it's a constant thing that's going on there. So it's it is a wonder we wonder other if, if you can, we can maybe consider them in terms of archetypes. What are they? Um, you know, so you know, grand they're presented as grandfatherly and grandmotherly, aren't they? Um, and if that's how, if that's how, Duncan Idaho sort of interprets them. Uh, wonder are they his grandparents? That could be an interesting one. <laughs> Probably not, but I'm sorry. I'm, I'm at, I wonder are they representations of Duncan Idaho's grandparents from his own. That that's what's being overlaid onto the thing that he can't, his mind can't truly understand. Hmm. It's interesting what, what to think about, isn't it? Um, so there we go. So that's, I mean, the final Duncan Idaho leaves is wide open. Um, yes, made them technos, I think, says Babs. I think there were characters in the other prequel books as well. Ah. Yeah, it's it's hard to get a, it's hard to get a, a you know put a pen on these two, um, and a deliberate cliffhanger. But I, said, I don't know if anybody's ever considered the fact that maybe Frank knew he was, you know, and um, Beverly passed away. I think in what year was it? I think he passed away in 1986, I believe. And um, I think Beverly passed away the year before. And I think Chapter House was published in 1985. So um, I think they line up. And if he was going in, I don't know, it's possible that he knew he was, was ill and that maybe he wasn't going to finish the book. Um, and it's, it's maybe just, and maybe just honestly, simply a cliffhanger that he would leave you with forever <laughs> and sort of have, have him and Bev say goodbye, possibly. Um, Part of me almost thinks that there's there is something bad to happen with the last dunk in Idaho goal in terms of a warning, but it's it's impossible to see what, um, you know, and, and I tend to get the sense it's the Benny Jesuit that running with, with whatever sense the, the the golden path may be at that time, but you know they've lost control again. It's possible. The Duncan was created by the Talix to be uh, Benny Talix to be a weapon against the Honored Matres. Hmm. That's right, but isn't it at that point that the original, the original Duncan's restored? I think when it's at the point of sexual, isn't it the point of the all the sexual imprinting, reverse sexual imprinting, <laughs> and and all of that stuff? I think, perhaps, um, if I can remember correctly, killed many of the new field. Hmm. Ah. I thought Alex. To be a weapon against the honored mattress, yeah, to resist the sexual imprinting, and then again, sometimes weapons are weapons are designed sometimes in the in the June universe to be genetic and, and to be delivered, if if you see what I mean, over generations into genes. <laughs> um, mm. uh, yeah, I was just just chatting about cliffhangers today with the wife, and just uh, thinking, uh, just you know, thinking about good ones and so on, but. Um, Two, two minutes, as I said, we were talking about the, the evidence that points to Duncan and Marty, and we can run with a few things. And um, we can run with, um, you know, we can run with the idea that they're face dancers of some kind or other type of face dancers. And we can also run with the idea that they're AI. And um, at, at the time of writing this, um, doing this work, um, I think that the idea of, of Frank's notes had just been revealed. And so I've, um, Myself and again, I've chatted with um, I think Dr. Kennedy about this. That we've uh, neither of us have seen the, the you know the Frank Herbert notes, um, but but I understand that there's a, a recent piece of academic work out there, and I think it's operating with them. So that might be interesting to see at some point. It'd be nice if they were published. Um, I think the, note, the notes of Frank Herbert, you know the you know. Uh, the June notes of Frank Herbert that they've actually built these words out of. I'd love to, they should publish them because they, they're quite into publishing anything by Frank, I think, anyway. <coughs> Excuse me. The stir up he caused among them, let them know they got him right. As in the Duncan Idaho, yes, absolutely. So, um, um, yeah, it's, 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 um, so and again, he he's kind of our last of our, our variables of the quiz at Sadaraki type people, and another evolutionary leap. And it, 
As I said, we talked about the, po the possibility of Kwisatz Sadaraks and Reverend Mothers both evolving naturally, you know. Sean says, hi, just got in. Sorry, Sean, hello. Nice to see you. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, so we're just having a wee natter about uh, The Last Duncan Idaho. And Babs has just been sort of saying that about, about how he was a well-designed weapon. And there's Chris. Hello, Chris. Um, did he intend for us to know where... Did he intend to... Sorry, let me just start again. Did he intend for us to know everything about who or what they were? He seems to have enjoyed the fact that his work got his readers thinking, not knowing everything isn't a problem. Absolutely. Well, yeah, I suppose it's... I think I was sort of saying maybe I just I was just wondering myself. I wonder maybe if, if Frank was uh, at that point in the end of Chapter House Tune, if Frank maybe knew a little bit about his own health and as you know, uh, his own mortality, I suppose, you know, because he, he passes away not too long after that. Uh, and it's the same with Babs. Uh, or sorry, not Babs, sorry. <laughs> You've not passed away, Babs. Bev, I apologize, his wife. Um, sorry about that, Babs. <laughs> uh, so, no, his, his, his wife, Bev, has just passed away. And um, and I think it's, he gets remarried quite quick, doesn't he? And then he's, he's not very well and in the hospital. And in a very short time, he's, he's kaput. Um, he's, he's passed away, you know. So I, I don't know. It's, it's if the, I would, as I said, maybe all those notes might reveal something, and maybe Brian would know. Brian Herbert would know more. Um, but in terms of does Herbert intend for us to know everything about them? No, absolutely not. And if he was going on with the book anyway, that's that would have been the setup. I think he would have worked with. He would have given us it. He would definitely be in, invested in giving you a good cliffhanger. And no, he's he's absolutely Chris, an, a writer who operates on not ramming anything down your throat at all he's not his messages are subtle and i think there's there's he's very much an educator in some ways but it's um yeah he, he likes you to think about things on your own he doesn't want to give you the answers and and in, in terms of just in terms of story craft i suppose we're talking about there are there are red herrings in, in the june series and uh the, you know things that little threads that just were not they might go. They might sound quite interesting, but they're not really going to lead anywhere. And um, whereas, whereas there's other things that we that are set up that we expect payoff for. Um, maybe we should. Maybe again, we just can't say where we were going to get that payoff. You know. Um, but it's uh, no. It's an absolute quality of Frank Herbert, Chris. Um, he he really does like. Just I don't want to give you the answers at all. Um, I think what is it he says if if you're looking to me for answers, you know, and thinking on forming a cult around, do what I do, run like you know, run like hell. He doesn't like that kind of. He doesn't want you to look to him for answers in particular. Um, and we we have a few quotes about that with the with the, the hero and stuff coming up. I think. Um, but at the same same time, I think Frank Frank's very good at promoting his books and, and thinking ahead, you know, and, and knowing that there is definitely going to be a June seven and. I think the, the general sense is that we people at the time when you knew it was going to be a last book, then a cliffhanger is kind of really what you want to sell the last book, isn't it? <laughs> Let's see, Christopher. Hi, Christopher. I always enjoyed the part Frank left out, especially after seeing how his son filled in the details. Um, well, we've been, we've been talking about that, I suppose, a wee bit on and off, Chris, Christopher. That you know, I'm I'm from a, when I read the June books, there was no ending, and you know. Um, that was it, and as, as again, the, the kind of the new stuff actually came out when I was starting the the PhD. Uh, so it was kind of a, oh, and, and I kind of thought things were a bit timely for me that way, you know. But um, it's yeah, there, there's plenty of details like that in all of the June series, and I think, and as you say, it's a bold choice. Christopher says bold choice to move the series book to book with time skips. Um, yeah, the and the. The, those time jumps are part of his attempt to run with um he, he is trying to show us something about evolution and he can't do it on a short time scale um and and what the action within june the june series um is presented as something that we would expect to happen on quite a long term scale actually happening really quickly um so excuse me but as you say the, the time skips some of us think of oh, thousands and thousands of years. It's it's meant to be really nothing in a kind of geological time frame, if you like. Um, hmm. 
So I don't know what you think. We were just chatting there prior to that about, excuse me, I suppose water, water, Daniel and Marty, and uh, uh, we had just been chatting about how they're presented there. Babs had said that Brian and Kevin had made them into uh, technos, I think, was it? Um, yeah, made, made them into technos, so what, artificial intelligence machines kind of thing. I, I've read them books, but I don't. I really don't remember. I think I only remember the end as sort of a like a super merger or something thing like that. And it's all very deus ex machina, machina type stuff, you know. So I'm just backing up a wee bit here. Da, 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 da. And the, yeah, we were covering the fact that Duncan was a, a weapon. Um, and again, one of these, again, becomes a quiz at Sarak, something that they've lost control of over and it happens at a crisis point, you know. Do, do let's go on down. So let's see. So, uh, and you don't think they were thinking machines, Christopher? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I've, I've been, I've been, I've been reviewing what I think about um, Daniel and Marty a wee bit, and I've been, I've actually been thinking that ultimately, if you think about the mysteries of June, and I think, I think it towards the end, there's a, two big mysteries, really. Well, no. Let's see. There's three. Um, I think if the June, the June series was going to have ultimate payoff under under Frank, uh, let me see if I just quickly scribble them down, um, then there would have to have been resolution to those three threads, if you like. And uh, number one is where do the worms come from? Uh, number two, who are Daniel and Marty? And number three is kind of what's the returning enemy? If, I, if I'm thinking of this through, um, and and four is that uh, I'll just say that the mention that's in the appendices of this that the the whole breeding program is not the Bene Jesuits. I'd say that's the other great unanswered question in June. I don't know if you'd agree with me. There's probably a couple more. Um, so Christopher says, I think the ultimate enemy might have been Face Dancer Xian Hybrid. Mm -hmm. There's something to do with the uh, an evolution of Xian technology with the Omni Honored Matres that they have these T probes, and I think it's noted that they're not of Xian manufacture. And this is this is towards the end of the. This would be to do with uh, Miles Tag that we were talking about yesterday. Um, as the owner mantras was a mixture of fish speakers and Bene Gesserit. Hello, Holly. Hello. Sorry, my doggy's just come in. Go on up there, pups. Here, let me take that out of your way. Go on. There you go. There you go. Sit down over here. Oh, she's off. Sorry about that. That's the other one. But I hope they're not going to annoy us too much. Um, so, well, yeah, Christopher, the, the suggestion is that they're possibly a sort of mixture of different things. Um, and we, we get a, you get that sense that a lot of combinations as I said that's the four I don't know what you think about this guy so I would go number one where did the worms come from and what are we know what they are is that they're an animal plant hybrid and as you're talking about all these groups hybrids breeding different things so the question is who made them and why <laughs> considering um, considering what a worm does if you put it on a planet. And um, who are Daniel and Marty and being presented as being presented as people who are gardeners? Could we say it? Would that be right? Um, I was saying I always think of the uh, the picture from American Gothic is about how they look. Um, hmm. So the, the returning enemy, here, here's, here's the line of thread I'm thinking on, folks. Um, the worms, where did they come from? Who made them? Did the returning enemy make the worms is kind of where I'm going with that. Um, is that a connection to Daniel and Marty? Is the worms something to do with them? Um, I think, and of course, this whose breeding program, husbandry, if you like, and, uh, and wifery, um, it's it's that's the kind of the main threads, and I think there would have to be some kind of um, maybe possible. I mean, again, maybe he wouldn't. He doesn't want to reveal any of these things that there should be always a bit of mystery. 
you know. The fetars, what's the fetars again? Is that a, um, that's an animal, isn't it, of some kind? Genetic human feline hybrid created by members of the bandage and actually gone out into the scattering. Allegedly. Let's see. Allegedly is a tool for hunting down and destroying honored mattress during a protracted and vicious war between the two groups. First mentioned briefly in Heretics of Dune, then appear in prominently in Chapter House Dune, a human feline hybrid. Hmm. I forgot about them. So just reading a week quick, yeah. Ah, okay. So that's uh that's another um well, well that's another that's a human animal hybrid then. Coming quite near the end. I totally yeah. Uh I missed that one, I think. That's quite interesting. Hello, Ran Domity. Uh Frank Herbert said Ran Domity says Frank Herbert's June books were about pushing the boundaries of humanity itself. The Butlerian Jihad may just may have been just a simple literary device to push push the AI notion to the background. Um, it, it it could be because the the Butlerian Jihad is really the the foundation of the June universe. Um, that thing that kind of fleshes out it gives it its verisimilitude, if you like. But there's there's no reason to believe that whatever whatever enemy ahead is the same way same as the one that's back. I think. Um, so, yeah, in, in that sense, I think uh, the, the, uh, pushing the boundaries of humanity, yeah. Um, what does it mean to be humans in there as well? And, um, and of course, Leto II is considered inhuman. So I, th I think he does retain some of his humanity. Um, But yeah, you're you're quite right, Random. It could be simply that it's keeping that 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 presence of AI always in the background, and always being a, you know, look at this when I do that. <laughs> um, so a, yeah, it's quite possible. In other words, Frank Herbert Random. He says never meant for AI to be the hidden enemy. Hmm. And of course, it's hidden. <laughs> That's the key word there. Um, so yeah. And ultimately, as as he, you, you can ask yourself if he was going to get June seven done, is he even going to reveal it? Um, in that sense, if you think about, if you think about Sauron in the Lord of the Rings, a book that June's often compared to, how's your reveal of your of your? Well, we we kind of know it's Sauron, but you you know, it's always just a a representation of him in a sense, isn't it? Um, and he's he's menacing and all that, but there's there's no actual physical threat from Sauron. If you, do you see what I mean? Um, it it could be it could just keep it hidden. I don't know, but you're expecting some sort of climactic um, end of the world type uh, end of the world type battle. Um, hmm. So there we go. But yeah, part of me thinks, as I said, we're having a wee chat. Who is this this unknown enemy? It's, a, it's an unknown enemy, isn't it? It's a hidden enemy, and that can, that has to the ultimate. I, I would put it this way: that the ultimate suggestion of that is that it's it's not any of the players in the field at the moment. At, by by the end of chapter house, whatever the enemy is, hasn't been has not arrived. Pardon me. You get the sense that the honored matra is and all are fleeing from it. Is that correct? If I remember correct. I'm not sure if I'm remembering that right, but you get the sense that the honored matter is the scattering heads out there. And you get the sense that the various peoples that go into into the scattering bump into something <laughs> and come back, you know, and that the, wherever they go, it's much more savage. <coughs> so it, it, I don't know the, the inter how, how Duncan Idaho sees Daniel and Marty. And, um, you know, I, I don't know what you guys think about the two characters. The, I think that their appearance as, as these, the, I think they're an elderly couple, aren't they? But as these sort of guarders is, is meant to present a benign, would you think um, um, that they're benign in some way? That they're not, they don't, I don't know if, would you argue maybe, do any of you think that they come across as hostile? In other words, um, I'm not sure what you think. 
as much as they 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 warn. So yeah, they totally warn Duncan Idaho of of the danger. So I'd I'd say that's not a hostile act. And I know they're curious, but it's um. Hmm. So yeah, it's not not if if the en hidden enemy is a hidden is is a hidden and b an enemy, those don't they don't seem like um. They don't see that doesn't seem like the actions of an enemy. Um, that and then, hey, there, there's an there's there, if I'm if I'm an if you're my enemy. Oh, you're spying on me. Hey, you know, if I can get at you, I, I, you get the sense that they can maybe. I don't know, or is that there's some kind of. It's like there's a connection between them that really shouldn't exist. It might be some sort of space-time thing. Ron Dominic says, gardeners might imply that they were cultivating humanity. Well, that's kind of where I was starting to think think about Daniel and Marty, is that, the, the, again, how, how Duncan sees them is meant to be, as far as I know, it's meant to be a kind of metaphorical, he can't see what he's seeing properly, his brain can't make sense of it. So these, this is the this is the construction, if you like, of his brain that allows him to make sense of, of what he's looking at. And so, in terms of how Don, Duncan Idaho views the world, possibly, but that's that's how they appear to him. So if 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 there if there's some sort of physical rep, or, you know, mental representation, the fact that they're gardeners, absolutely, um, cultivating humanity, cultivating. And are, so are, are there some like sort of godlike beings? They're described as having um, godlike and is it godlike? They're described as being god godlike intensity. Is that right? I think. Um, but yeah, the gardeners grow, and again, the ecological message within June. Um, you'll you'll find it comes after the the message on we, we, we look at the evolution the hero and then ecology um people would argue that june's really famous for ecology but it's not it's it, that theme kind of dies a death pretty much unless we were going to get a final lesson again about possibly the worms or where they're from and what you know if if the worms are artificially created you know for for what purpose and um, if you think about what they do, you know, uh, it is fascinating. I, I often think the Earth's not mentioned very much in the original, in the, in the June series. I think it's mentioned once, isn't it, in June? But um, it's possible that the worm, that's what whatever happened to Earth in the June universe it could have something to do with the worms. And we've, we've po pointed out that they're, as much as they're a, a megafauna, um, they have a very similar life life cycle, etc. Don't even look like uh, the lamprey, you know. Um, hydraulic despotism could be, could be, could be a, a yeah, uh, could be a way of choking off of what planet's water supply. Absolutely, drop worms on it and goodbye water. Water is essential for life. Uh, it's interesting, yeah. So again. It, it, Bunch of threads to be tied up with, um, you know. As I said, what is it they're looking through? And I, I, Paul, part of me thinks it's possible that Duncan's looking through time. I think. Um, I don't know. Again, give us your opinions, guys. Um, but it's a tricky one. It's it's a complete. You know, whatever was going to happen, I think you get the sense that whatever's going to happen in June 7 is going to happen immediately after the events in Chapter House. It's going to follow directly on. And um, yeah, you get a sense that there's going to be, there was going to be a lot of immediate payoff in the next book. But it's, you know, um, just to conclude the action and move things forward. But uh, in, in terms of, of the action, if, if it was to be the last book, um, you know, it would have to be driven a certain way and head a certain direction. Um, that's what I think the big. That's what I think the main threads are really. It's, it's, it's again. And what's 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 Duncan Idaho's connection um, to Daniel and Marty? How is he able to make a connection to them? And what kind of connection is it? And um, is it is it a quality of? It's a, see, we were talking about um, what was the term Babs used earlier there? Was it co locate out of the you're talking about how he co located out of the um, 
the no ship, I think, uh, in order to commun- in order to whatever he's doing with Daniel and Marty. Um, I was saying that, it's, well, better term, the term that we're going to look at as we look in the hero chapter is called by location. And it's one of the, the qualities of Kwisatz Haderach. Um, within the Dune series, the, he can be many places at once, but essentially it means somebody can be in two places at once. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, um, once, you know, well, uh, yeah. What's going on there? Um, <laughs> and I, I, as I said, that, I think the interesting question is Daniel, really, first of all, Daniel Marty in the, in the future and in the past, um, or is it just some, you know, also the present, I suppose, is possible, but they don't, it doesn't seem like they're in the present. And um, whatever it is that, yeah, whatever it is that Duncan Idaho's doing, it, it seems, it's, it's almost like a, you know, somebody sneaking in and watching the gods feast or that kind of thing. It's it's just seems I don't know, a bit um, some. There's definitely something there. You know, uh, Christopher says. Um, then again, it is Frank. So a hundred years in the future, we catch up with our new players. <laughs> yeah, he could have, he could have actually put in a serious draw, uh, gap in the action there. You know, um, but he might just as easily. Chris says uh, introduce something new in a seventh book. Um, it might be something he'd mentioned before, however briefly, or something from left of field. Uh, Bob says, off to cook. See you all tomorrow. See you later, Babs. Take it easy. Um, hmm. Yeah, I, th- I, th- I think, Chris, that's what we were just sort of saying. Um, the idea of a hidden enemy. Um, you can think about it in a couple of ways, but that's why I thought that, that Daniel and Marty's response to Duncan was not that of an enemy. If you see what I mean, um, and hidden doesn't mean it. Hidden just means that out of sight, I suppose. It doesn't mean that that the enemy is new and coming back. It it could be something that's been there all along and that nobody's seen. Um, but the, the again, the way hidden works within the Jin universe, we're probably talking about something to do with no technology and and some sort of evolution of that as well. But yeah, Chris, I, I agree. Um, I, I, the whole point is I think we're always getting something new in the Dune series and, and our, the, the ideas do evolve. So I think some, something was definitely going to go there. And uh, I don't know what you think. You know, As I said, the, I think the worms still remain, as much as I did a fair chunk on the worms, they still remain a mystery um, at, at the end of chapter. We have no idea really where they came from um, we understand that they're transplanted. We also understand that they're half plant and half animal. So they sound engineered. Um, I think that's quite interesting. But in terms of the sort of missing, the missing kind of really big questions at the end of the Dune series, you know, where did the worms come from? I think is we've, we've forgotten about that one maybe a wee bit. Um, uh, who are Daniel and Marty? Certainly, what what's the I think what's the nature of the connection between Duncan, Daniel and Marty, and of course who's the who's the returning enemy, and and is the returning enemy the people that are I suppose this is the point or Daniel and Marty? It's not necessarily the returning enemy, um, but are they the people who started the breeding program in the first place? Because in that appendix, we're told that the whole thing, but about, again about the Bene Gesserit, it's not their idea. So, and if if, if if Duncan Idaho possibly is looking at some kind of other memory, then maybe they're the some kind of um, originators for that, if you see what I mean. Crowley, Christopher Crowley says, I, I, would have, I would have liked to see Leto's awareness have made its way back for the seventh book. Because uh, there's a pearl of him in every worm, isn't there? Um, Ron Dominic says, so what would be the probability that a completely unknown species could produce a substance that enhances human life? Maybe the worm's spice was a gift to humanity to push the boundaries to the max. Uh, it's a good point. We can, so you imagine that the whole thing is a, a construct of some, yeah, th- like a, a bit like the monolith in 2001. Ron Dominic, as opposed to a spur itself, is, are the worms a gom jabbar? Uh, but yeah, it's, they're... they're <laughs> You know, they 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 turn a planet into desert, but but um, essentially excrete 
substances that that um, you know help you know help you from stop you from aging and so on. So in terms of what what the spice does, I suppose it would would be in some people's minds desirable. Um, the the emperor is in his seventies or something and supposed to look like he's in about thirty or something like that. I think. Um, Christopher says my favorite book was God Emperor, and at least the Duncan Idaho being bred over and over might make more sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so something. Yeah, again. Well, it, it, I think the nature of his personal other, his personal other art. What do you call that? Race memory, race consciousness, other memory. I think opens up all sorts of questions, and, and it, it, is it a limited? Collective unconscious, if you see what I mean. Um, does it stop with the first Duncan Idaho, or would would his collective unconscious continue on down the male line, for example? Um, yeah, just just so I suppose, isn't it that the, really the new the, the Duncan and the Miles are kind of the new Miles tag, and the Duncan are still sort of learning about themselves as they go. Um, we often find one thing a response to another. So no, it is just full of mystery. We've we've got no answers at all, folks. As, but we've all got we've all got ideas and um, speculations, and and they're all pretty good. And as I said, I think the problem with uh, what some of us have been talking about is that um, hmm, how do we put this? Frank Frank's given us enough evidence, you know, within that he's sowing seeds for stuff. And I think all because we can follow these these seeds along a trail, if you see what I mean, um, that they, they will take us down certain paths, and all of them are unfinished, but they're they're all kind of logical, um, and a few of them possibly are logical, but anything can happen. I think in the Jin universe, I suppose, and um, the very nature of everything, the whole the prescience, the it, it the sense of it culminating into something something quite big. I don't know. Um, it, it's often my experience that when you write when pe people who write books like this um, do this with TV series and things like that um, that when you build up to such a big you know it's not just we're having a war or anything like that it's, it's the absolute you know ultimate form of total war it's the battle at the end of the universe um very hard, you know, the build and build and build. If that's what we're heading to, and we're either going to prevent it or it's going to happen. And if it's going to, you know, I think there would ultimately be, um, how should we put it, um, a bit of an anticlimax, I think, unless that there was, I'm not, I'm not sure how you can bring so many things together and deal with it, you know, get a satisfying end to the story. And I, and I think Brian and um, Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson had a reasonably good go at it, but I, I think it was um, extremely difficult. To, so many threads, and, and ultimately, I think for, for myself, it was just yeah, okay, it makes sense, but I felt it felt a bit unsatisfactory. And I think a lot, some people are very happy with it. And I think it's almost a, a excuse me, almost almost two equal camps. Um, you know that either people find it, yeah that it does make sense or no I think you've completely ignored this you know um, uh, Christopher said it could have been a good series unrelated to June well it, it's 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 a deliberate ending you know and um, they split it into two books and I think um, I suppose it all depends on the notes and stuff like that. Um, and regardless of, I think we've talked about this, regardless of what Frank Herbert's notes were, um, if you could hand those notes to 10 different writers and go, there you go, there's the notes on the final June book, write that for me, and you would still get 10 different books in it, and they'd all be different than Frank's version, I think. So uh, I don't know. It's, it's, I think it was a hard task to finish the June stories, um, the June series, because it, it's, it is so open. But it, I think it is a bunch of, it's a load of different deus ex machinas that come together and um, I don't know what you guys think, but I, I've, unless I'm watching sort of Greek theatre, uh, <laughs> deus ex machinas just make me go, mm, you know, because, uh, ah, dear. And it, it's usually, and I, I don't think we would have got one from Frank, to be honest. Um, I'm not sure, I've not noticed him work with them 
elsewhere. But I'd, I'd say a Deus Ex Machina is quite a weak way of ending a complicated story, and it's often when you'll you'll find it's often when a people who try to write complicated epic type stories, you know, it's over several vo volumes, often lose the threads of their 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 narrative and their themes quite badly. And often when they decide to come to a conclusion, there's a sense of, like, I've got to get all of this stuff uh, tied up. I've got to get all these things together. And we often it, it often comes together. And like I would almost kind of, rather than a smooth set of streams of, of being resolved, it ends up like a bit of a Gordian knot, a mess at the end. Um, and, and I think when you do cover things, I don't know. I think he might have left the June. I think he might have. I think Frank Herbert would have given us a conclusion to it, but I think he might have left it open as well, if you see what I mean. But um, it's a, it's a question of how quickly cometh Kralizek. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Sean Wyland says these mythical notes that no one except Brian Herbert has seen. Sean, um, my understanding is a few days back. Um, I, having a wee look around for something, but I think there's a new academic paper that's been published on Oxford Press, and it's on it's a Frank Herbert, it's on um, Frank Herbert's June, and I I picked it up because my work's referenced on it, Sean, um, which is the first time I've seen my work referenced anyway. <laughs> but um, my I, I've had a nosy through it, and there's references to these notes in it. So, so whoever's whoever's um, I can't remember the name offhand, so I just glanced at this the other day. I'll, I'll get some information for you. But this person's had access to the notes, apparently. So uh, there you go. And Because uh, at the minute, there are two academics who've done doctorates on June, and neither of us have seen them. <laughs> but from, from my point of view, they were not, you know, um, I think they were only just, again, turned up when I was doing this. So, <coughs> excuse me. I said when I when I started doing my PhD, June was unfinished as well, you know. Christopher says I can forgive the Butlerian Jihad trilogy and the conclusion seventh and eighth books. Uh, my only outrage were the shoehorn books between Frank's original works. Uh, Dave says congrats on being referenced. <laughs> oh, thank you very much, David. Uh, well, I, I think it, I, I must, I'll, I'll get some info on that for you. It looks an interesting article. I, I sort of skimmed through, kind of was looking at different things on it, but it um, looks like a master's thesis or something, I think. Um, so, yeah, Sisters of June, e Extras of June. Um, that, I mean, I, I knew, I got the house, the three house books, and they're, they're prequels, really, aren't they? And um, read those. And the two that finish off the June series, and as I said at the, at the end of those three, I thought that was okay, and they, they were working away. But I'm I'm not a fan of um, uh, any author who keeps churning out books in a universe. Really, will will just kind of lose my interest. And um, Sister of June, Extra of June, you know, uh, Banquets of June, you know, um, <laughs> uh, it, it starts. It, it's uh, what's next. <laughs> And I think you yeah, end up, you know, they're going to probably look at every minor character, you know, and do a book on them. And then, um, you know, they could do a book on sieges, the siege trilogy, you know. Uh, probably, have they not done a book about who invented the still suit yet? If you see, you see what I mean? It's, it's, um, where these things fit in and give uh, that are mentioned and part of the world that you create, they give, they lend verisimilitude to it. But whenever we start, writing books on every little aspect of this world. It, 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 we understand it fleshes out the thing, maybe, but it's um, it, it dilutes the, the, the source material. And, um, you know, uh, toilets of June. <laughs> you know, uh, where's the best WCs on Arrakis? Um, <laughs> Brian Herbert's money grabbers. Well, we all have to make a living, possibly. It's maybe, you know, but I'm sure he writes it. He must write other stuff, does he? Um, I have a book. I mean, Frank Frank wrote a book, uh, wrote with his son. Uh, it's a science fiction book, actually. That's it. We talk a wee bit about it. Man of Two Worlds. So that's Frank. And, you know, I'm maybe helping his son out learn his craft and stuff, you know. But I, I, I do think there's a there's a strong juxtaposition with, with what Frank Herbert wanted for June, which was it to be considered... To bring to bring science fiction out of the literary, you know, he, he calls it the gutter. That's his own words, 
and, and produce a piece of literature and it's not like pulp fiction and, and I, I'd, I'd argue that the Dune series now is pulp fiction um, and I'm sure it's uh, nothing wrong with pulp fiction don't get me wrong but it, it's um, there's there's something of a bit of a, di a difference in the intent I think let's see here's about the books of books of Stilgar <laughs> uh Fremen weaving patterns of <laughs> of Aragus, uh of June, sorry, you know, who knows? Bosses of June. Uh I always like to imagine that there's worm stops after after the after the after the 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 after the you know the the Arrakis affair and Paul's the Emperor and stuff, I always like to imagine that there's wee stops where we're <laughs> Fremen come along and whoa and others hop on. <laughs> if you see what I mean. Uh, it's quite so you can have fun with, with uh, speculating on June, wasting water on Arrakis. Yeah, <laughs> uh, air toilets, perhaps. Yeah, you get you get the drift. It, it is. It's just um, I said it, it's it's production really. Uh, it's a suspect simply an effort to keep the whole thing rolling along. Yeah, um, I don't know. So, you know, some 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 worlds can can do rightly with 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 plenty of expansion, I suppose, but. Um, June's the sort of thing that messes with your idea of what's going to happen, even what is happening at, at, at any given time, if you think. Um, remember at the end of the first novel, Margot Fenner was pregnant with Fade Routh's child. Did anything ever come from that? Ah, just, just, just reading about, about I'm reading that bit where uh, Fade Routh and his lady Margot were on uh, Giddy Prime at the minute, and that's what they're all geared up to get uh, Fade Routh's DNA. Um, so I'd imagine that it's about that's a Benny Gesserit plot. It actually shows you that um, Fenring Count Hazemir Fenring is very much a Benny a Benny Gesserit operator. I think as much as he's the Emperor's buddy, he he works for the Benny or he works with and for the Benny Gesserit. You know, um, so yeah, absolutely, Rand I don't think I, I, it's it's. It, I don't know. It's one. It'll be one of their bloodlines, and they want. They want. They're acting to save it before, uh, before he's killed, isn't he? Isn't it? Um, I suppose that's from a Bene Gesserit point of view. The the Bene Trilax would be ha quite happy to grab his body as well. So no, yeah, probably the whole Harkonnen, and really sort of Paul and his uh, his mother are kind of as Paul tell, tells them they're Harkonnens. That's what we call the Atreides line because of Paul's father, but um. Mm. So no, don't know. It's uh, but there, there's possibly something of it, you know. Um, long, long down down the road. What what is um, is it is it? I don't. Could some maybe is it Janet Roxburgh? Is um, Janet Roxburgh Tag is the mother of Miles Tag, and her husband's a guy called Lux is it Lusky Tag. And um, I think there's a they remind me um whenever we get later on, it's kind of about Miles Tag talking about his parents, but they remind me quite a bit on um Margot Fenring and um Count Hazemir Fenring. I think they're two, they're quite similar characters. Sean says too true about the gutter of sci fi, they all end up written like Harlequin novels. You know, it's it's um much as the, <laughs> I don't know. I'm one of these people that lives in the gutter sometimes. I, I, it's it's not always the worst place to be, uh, sure. <laughs> if you see what I mean. Um, but um, there's a lot of good stuff there as well. But it's it's just you know, um, it's not it's not literature. It doesn't make it doesn't make them bad stories. I suppose you know. A lot of these the stuff. Think about it, it's good enough to get published. You know. Um, but same time and time, there's a lot of this stuff churned out. But it's, yeah, I, I suppose I, I'm from a time where it's where you're getting a lot more, you're getting a lot more quality, rather than quantity. If you see what I mean. Um, and, but I, I don't get any sense of dilution with Frank Herbert, Frank Herbert's June series. Uh, as as you go forward, you know, you're going okay, six books really, you know. But I, actually, where he's been going is on an, you know, you're following it in an evolutionary way. And it, it kind of does make sense. Um, and so I, I think as you go through the six June books, I know some people struggle, maybe they leave, some people leave the June series at different points. But if, if you do stick with it it, 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 it does make sense and it has a sense it's heading somewhere. 
Um, and I said we never get we never quite get to find out where, but there, there's a there is a strong sense of direction to the book, and because it's the reiteration of these warnings. Um, the other thing that I kind of expect in the last June book is the final iteration of Frank's warning. I, I don't think he would keep doing this. Um, as I said, we talked about Miles Tag not having um, qualities of, of, of the Camelot pattern. And at, at the point where we see Duncan Idaho, I think does have some of those qualities, the final Duncan Idaho. Um, hmm. But I, I think, you know, Frank definitely had an intent of going somewhere with his, his hero thing. And he really was. I, and I, I, if, if that reiterative pattern, is, it's a fundamental, you'll see this as we come up, it's fundamental of his writing. Then the, the obvious thing, and as much as everybody talks, oh, what's obvious, they should be face dancers, they should be this, that. The obvious thing that I was expecting in, in the final gym book is the, the ultimate iteration of that warning about humans, or sorry, about heroes. And I, I, the thing that I was looking for is where is it coming from? Because I can't see it. And it could be him it could, again with this thing, or it could be the Bene Gesserit as, a, as an order, um, if you see what I mean. Um, but that's what I was kind of expecting. Chris says, we were discussing pulp a couple of weeks ago. Uh, nobody is ever in the bar in a pulp book because if authors are paid per word. <laughs> uh, so a more detailed answer from the barman than yes, made the author money. Mm. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, we joke, Chris. Um, Sean says, I think Frank Herbert is quoted as saying that some days he was unmotivated to write and other days very inspired. Very inspired, sorry, but he says upon reading it afterward, he, he can't tell the difference in writing. Hmm. Yeah, I think, I think, yeah. Uh, it's, it, his, his attitude to the writing, I think, is, is quite important, Sean. Um, some days he's unmotivated to write, other days very inspired, but said upon reading it afterward, he couldn't tell the difference in writing. Um, he, he does work at his craft, um, I think. And well, put it put it this way: we can all. It's interesting what you're saying there, Sean. I think it's really interesting. We can all tell the difference between Frank's June and Brian and Kevin's, can't we? You know, and I I actually think you could play a game with this. I think, you know, you know all the the introductions to the June series. Each chapter begins with well, in June it's pretty much Errol and isn't almost always giving you some kind of commentary on you know the life of Muad'Dib but we get various other books and as I said their histories hagiographies bibli or biographies that kind of thing and each one of them is kind of like a hmm, very formal sounding quote you could take any a whole pile of them put them into a hat you know right print them out put them into a hat take all the ones from the Brian Herbert books and play a game of Frank or Brown uh, <laughs> if you see what I mean and I think it'd be very it'd be a very one-sided game um you know, you wouldn't have difficulty doing it. But um, he, he talks about all the different, um, I think you're going to see, he, he talks about writing and um, using Jungian mandalas and haiku and then reshaping it to make it into English prose. Um, and I, I don't know if that's, I think that's possibly Frank exaggerating a wee bit for an interview. Um, <laughs> you know, um, but, but um, yeah. I was just about to say the introduction sections are good. Let me says, yeah, I think it could be a game. <laughs> but as I said, I don't, I don't think it. It's very easy to go. That's Frank, that's Brian and Kevin. You know, um, uh, and it's because of what we're talking about that that uh, the writer's voice, if you like, if you, how they write. <coughs> Excuse me. We were saying that some writers are have been very successful in coming in to write in a dead author's property. And, and generally, when fans of that, when when you, you'll always have a fan base, um, and I think Els Bragg de Camp's a good. I think I said Els Bragg de Camp, if I'm if I'm right, is a good example of that within the, writing within the Robert E. Howard Conan universe. You know, it's about getting the voice right and knowing that that other author, and very few sort of I suppose what you might almost think of them as they're not ghostwriters who are coming into writing another author's world. Very few would attempt to really get that. They might use the same characters and all that, but they'll write with their own shades. And very few would attempt to to mimic that writer. If, if I was going to try and write a new, say, H.P. Lovecraft story, 
uh, something like you know for for the the Lovecraftian mythos. Um, if it, you know, if it was if it was to be presented that way, you could either, either do it myself or I'd also do it as a, a damnedest to try and imitate. If I wanted to do it really well, I'd imitate H.P. Lovecraft in, in my writing. I'd, I'd 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 go through his stories, identify his particular turns of phrase, his, his real it's it's um his idiosyncrasy. I hate saying that word idiosyncrasies. <laughs> if you see what I mean, and um, the, we we all have them. And it, it, you know, there's a way of actually writing like another writer if if you wish to imitate them well. And I don't I don't think that I suppose that the way that the new books are written is I think I, I remember seeing this on something on Twitter. I think them talking about one of the new June books, and uh, I think they put it together in a month. Really, whoosh, done. There's a book. On to the next one, and. Um, you can put put that into perspective with 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 um, Frank Herbert telling you five years to write the first book. So five years for June, one month for. Um, so there you go. I think that that speaks for itself. But they're they're um, as I said, they're they're fine writers and stuff like that. It's um, I think what most people get really get a bit annoyed with is that, that it's a, a the June series a bit beloved and b they're not really satisfied. It just doesn't come across as being. Frank's June Universe, you know, I think, and, and the, although it is, I suppose, but uh, I don't know what you guys think of the, I don't know, the, the, the Brian Herbert, I kind of go, I kind of, I don't, I said I'm not kind of like this, I've read, so I've read five of their books, but I've read, I've read Brian Herbert's um, uh, biography of his father, and I've also, you know, uh, Man of Two Worlds there, so I've read a fair bit of books by him, really, if you think about it, and I don't, I don't have a problem with his writing in any way, I think, I think there's just a lot of vehemence that Directed at him that that comes out of um, fandom, I suppose a wee bit, and it's seen as a bit, a bit maybe. Um, I suppose yeah, it's just mass producing. It, it's a, become a franchise, and I think it's just that maybe people look at the June series and they, they have a certain amount of respect for it. I think, um, but at the same time, I understand there's lots and lots of they have loads of fans, and, and uh, there's a lot of people who really do want to see that world fleshed out. People, readers of books, generally if a world is fascinating or a universe is fascinating to you, you want to return there time and time again. Um, from my point of view, I'd like to return to a place like that now and then, as long as it doesn't get a bit, you know. Otherwise, it's on to something new. And uh, um, So personally, from my own point of view, big series like that, I, it's just I don't have time for them. I'd, I'd rather get on to something different. Um, there's too much other stuff out there to read, and um, so to me, that's I've, I did did go in with the you know the hunters of June, sandworms of June to finish the story. That was again just to be thorough. But I read I read both books before finishing up this work, and um, and that was really all there was apart from the the dreamer of June biography. I think it was around the time. And it was a good book. It's very enjoyable. Um, gives you a lot of insight into Frank. I think. <coughs> Excuse me. There we go. Um, how are we doing? I'll tell you what, folks. Um, it's a wee bit uh, getting a wee bit tired tonight, and it's uh, uh, getting on. But we'll go on for about another ten minutes or fifteen minutes or so. It's only it's not too late yet, and then we'll maybe call it a night. So if you've got any more questions um, or thoughts on on um, the final Duncan Idaho, it's it's kind of gone. Yeah, we're quite June heavy tonight, I think, aren't we? And as I said, I don't know. Um, I'd love to. Know, I know. I think we got a few comments there, <laughs> there about. Uh, um, mm, Brian Herbert's book. Some of you don't like them. Some of you, I think, do. And I think that's fine. It's it's just a question of your, you know. Um, but I, I do see them as just. I I do look at the six the six books of June by Frank Herbert. Uh, that's my that's the canon for Frank Herbert's June as far as I'm concerned. And uh, yeah, but yeah. I do like Pulp Fiction, by the way. As I said, I, 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 we've had a wee chat about this. I, everything doesn't have to be lit, high literature. Do you know what I mean? Um, there's lots of just good old, good old fashioned stories out there that are, um, and there's different ways of writing. Well, um, as much as we're talking about prose egg or purple po purple prose, was it the other day? Um, you know, uh, sometimes a good straightforward story told in a straightforward way is is very, very enjoyable. Um, 
And yeah, uh, but I would definitely something at the level of detail within the Jun series must be hard to sustain for a writer. Um, you know, Christopher says, Have a great night. I appreciate your content. You're off, Christopher. No worries. Thank you very much, sir. Um, but yeah, as you were saying, I think the, the introduction sections are good. Let, let this test to the, the sense of the Jun books, you know. Brad Rose says, Butler's book, hello, Uh I want to read it thanks to you. Erewhon, yeah, sorry, I got through. Uh, I want to read it thanks to your channel. Would it be hard to track down? Not at all. Um, not at all, Brad, at all. Uh, hang on. Um, Erewhon. Do, 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 do. You should find it. And Erewhon, you should find it in any good bookshop, um, I would say. There we go. But it is a, there's a penguin. That's mine's a penguin classic. Get the, the, the shine off it there. It's a good edition. And um, yeah, uh, if not, just pop it in. It's it's absolutely in print and is a penguin classic. So um yeah, oh here, that's nice big text in this. I like that. Uh you can see mine has been as usual. <laughs> um but uh, yeah, it's it's a book you'd also find in kind of you know those old wee sort of red hardback second hand books that you find in second hand bookshops from the turn of the century, um or the turn of the last century. Um, but yeah, no, it's not. It's not difficult. Samuel Butler is still reasonably well read, um, I would say. So you you should find um, Era One. You you might not find Era One revisited, Brad. Um, so Era One has a sequel. Um, but I would just go with Era One for now. Um, if you're really into it, go with Era One revisited. But uh, sweet, cheers, bro. No worries, Brad. Uh, but yeah, it's quite easy to find, so we should get it online, no bother. Um, yeah, but books like that tend to have longevity because it, it's got it's it is a, it is a science fiction book. It's a kind of utopian fiction. First book really on on kind of machine intelligence and machine evolution. It, it really does have its place in in literary history. Um, but uh, yeah, Butler's often known for different things depending on how you look at them. But uh, yeah, very important. A uh, very important figure in Victorian society, uh, certainly in terms of his writing and his commentary on that society. So um, it's a good book, Brad. Um, I think Babs had said earlier there's a there's a Libra box. Is that correct? Libra Libra box or Libra box? Um, recording online. That's a good reading. Um, <laughs> uh, depending on how you look at it, Brad, it's an utopia with an E. <laughs> So utopia with you is no place, so it's not one of those, and it's not really a dystopia, no. Um, it, it's a utopia with an E, E-U-T-O-P-I-A, one of those. Um, but it, it is a topsy-turvy world, um, I think. So, yeah, it's, it, often when we get into utopian fiction and the, the, the definitions there, um, but the, the one that utopia is, that, that you've written there is the name of Thomas Moore's book, and it's a pun on the word utopia. Um, so that one there actually means no place, um, which is the one I suppose most people's understanding. But E U T O P I A O U in the, sort of the Greek U is good, so it, a utopia is a good place. So yeah, Erewhon's not meant to be a horrible society. It's it's just a back. It's a reversed um, inversion society, if you like. Everything's backwards. <coughs> Excuse me, Chris Gibson says play books. I've got his works covered. Yeah. Um, Samuel Butler's got quite a quite a decent output. Um, if you have a look at the, the bibliography at the back of, of the last video, you'll see there. But he writes on all sorts of things. But he, he has he was a commentator on evolution, um, and um, he also wrote a. So I suppose Era One, Era One revisited the way of old, the way of all flesh, is was his last last book published a year after he died, and it was the it's the book that's generally seen as a searing indictment on Victorian family values. Um, so it's, uh, um, hence he's known as the one of the great sort of Victorian iconoclasts. So yeah, um, he's also, I think, uh, excuse me, he's got a very technical nose. He's also, <laughs> he's also um, well known for, I think he's written a book on the, I had a theory that um, Homer, uh, the, author, the, the composer of um, the Iliad and the Odyssey, was a woman, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole book on this. It's a, it's an idea that's come up again recently, I think. Um, so there we go. But yeah, Butler's book's excellent. Um, yeah, 
Um, as, uh, I, I researched them really well, by the way, uh, guys. There's, um, if you want a bit of insight into him, there's lots of his letters and stuff um, collected. Uh, and in particular, this whole engagement with Dar Darwin, it was a public spat, but it was conducted, it was not conducted face to face. Um, so there, there's correspondence. And I said it was a one sided spat, if you like. It was Butler just having an outright attack against Charles Darwin. So he's one of Darwin's fiercest critics in the 19th century. Um, and if you check, yeah, check him out, you'll find it probably a very detailed, uh, I imagine there's a fair bit on Samuel Butler, the author on, on Wikipedia, for example, give you give you a fair idea about him. Um, I think there's a bit more to him than appears, actually, and even I know. I think, they, I think there's um, possibly some different academics looking at him these days in a new light. <coughs> Excuse me. But um, he hated he hated Darwin, basically. I think I think we pointed out in this chapter because Darwin's the theory of evolution basically just um, present as kind of what Erwin's about in, in the book of the machines. That's those three chapters are his response in a way. But it presents a mechanistic view of the world to to, to Butler, and initially he finds this attractive. Uh, so he's a supporter of Darwin initially, and then full on out attack because it it really. Um, it's, it's the, uh, Bar Butler's big things to do with his, his own family, I suppose, as well. But it, it just wrecked his views of um, life, the universe, and everything. And I, and I think it, I, don't, I don't think he knew what to do with it. So I, you'd come. I'd argue Butler's very angry. Um, and views life as mechanistic after that, and just just I think ultimately maybe comes back to his own family and maybe is seeking for some kind of. Theological answer to everything, but but it really did mess with him quite badly, I suppose. Um, so, but there you go. Um, I don't know if you're still there or not, Brad Rose, but um, Vril, the coming race, um, which is the other the, the other one of those 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 two books are kind of a pair for a funny reason. Um, they come out one year after each other. It's to do with the evolutionary argument at the time, and both books were associated with both both authors. Both books were published anonymously. So uh, Vril, The Coming Race, is a really good read as well. Um, uh, once lovers become great enemies. <laughs> uh, Butler and... Uh, mm, yeah, yeah, really. It's As I said, the whole thing, I think the funny thing about that was that, um, as I said, I think before... Brad, there's 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 a family relationship. Not not their families know each other. Um, so the, yeah, and it's I don't know that it's complicated with with Butler and Darwin's family. There there's 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 they, the families know each other in a way. I can't remember the the, the absolute details. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's it's. it's Butler's attacks are very intimidating to to Darwin, and, and because of that, he doesn't respond publicly to them. Uh, and as, you know, Victorian society kind of looks at this a wee bit as you know what's going on there. Um, sort of maybe as, as Darwin a wee bit timid, or is there something to this? I suppose. But it was just it was um, the research that I dug up uh, suggested that it was the vehemence of um, Butler's argument that intimidated Darwin, and that. When asked about it, Butler was unaware of any kind of vehemence. He just thought he was having a bit of a giggle, or as how he presented it. But I, I don't think that's correct, you know. Pol Polishing Boots tonight says, David, so as not to shine my keyboard excessively, I'll just say I thought the brand novel started out okay. Um, I like the whole idea of the Titans. Lost lost me with the psychic part. Um Yeah, I, I suppose the kind of, the, this if we have those kind of psychic powers, Sort of thing. June's not. I suppose they're not really meant to be psychic powers in that sense, but it's part of the kind of hero that that June's written as a response against. There's heroes like that. Um, Titans are they? Are they mechs or something? Or I can't remember. Is that the AIs or something? Um, don't know if that's why, but I lost interest and didn't go further than the second book. I don't strongly dislike it, but it doesn't have what I do like about June for the most part. Happy night to all, says David. Yeah, good night, David. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's it's. I think it just doesn't have enough of what you're expecting, really. The, the, it's it's the names, the characters, all of this, the places are the same, but the, there's it's the soul. Um, 
for want of a better word, the spirit of the books that's different, I think. And a big part of that is, is uh, Frank's voice, I think. Uh, I, I mean, I've read an awful lot of Frank's stuff, um, a lot more than his son's books, I would say. But I, I really do know what Frank sounds like, <laughs> if you see what I mean. And I'm used to his voice in the June world. Um, Davis says, Titans were the cyborg humans who ruled for several years before the AI took over, I think. Carol says, hi. Hi, Carol. You're just catching us at the end, mate. I think we're just we're going to go for about another 10 minutes, and that'll do. But uh, thanks very much for joining us. You weren't you weren't nipping out to see June again tonight, were you? <laughs> uh, Davis says, it opens with potential, but I feel like the rest is better left a mystery to, to me. Anyway, nice to see all of you again tonight, Tom. Thanks very much, David. Good night. Um... Hmm. Opens with potential. Yeah, we were just having a wee bit of a natter there, Karen, just to, to catch you up on the on the Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson books and, and the, the June books, I suppose. Uh, really, with the, hitting this episode about looking at um, the final Duncan Idaho goal, it's really his character that takes us right up to the end and provides us with the, all of these cliffhangers and, and so on and so forth, you know. Um, but yeah, we're just sort of discussing a wee bit of the differences there. I mean, how do we had a quick chat about Errol on there? Um, I think sorry, uh, Brad I was just saying about Vril, the coming race is, is a, a really good read and it reads in the vein of kind of journey to the centre of the earth that kind of thing and I think that's the book where Herbert gets the main idea for Melange from uh, the drug Vril is very similar to, to Melange so it's, it's a good read um, yeah Edward Bulwer Lightness was I keep saying he's the guy that came up with the pen is mightier than the sword you know so any questions, Karen, or anybody else? Any questions just where we head down towards the end of the night? Uh, or any comments? Fire away, folks. Let me hear your thoughts. As always, we're covering loads and loads of different things. Uh, we still no none the wiser as to who Daniel and Marty are. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're, I suppose we were just talking about what mysteries remain at the end of Chapter House June as well. Uh, what's what threads haven't been haven't been tidied up and what would Frank possibly have done with them, you know? But we were saying the worms in particular. Where are the worms from? What what's going on there? And what's the whole point of them? And again, somehow attached to ecological message. Who are Daniel and Marty? What's the returning enemy? The hidden enemy? And um, or you know, uh, and and that little thing in the appendices about um, whose whose breeding program is it really? And um, part part of me thinks that somebody were talking about. The, Daniel and Marty being visually represented as gardeners, that it's possibly them, uh, possibly them who created the worms, possibly, you know, who knows? Um, so there we go. But I know Duncan Idaho is a very favourite favorite character of a lot of people. And I suppose we don't see too much of him in June 1. Then we have the hate goer in uh, June Messiah and uh, Children of June. Then we get the, uh, the most recently decanted Duncan in... Um, uh, God Emperor, and then we run forward again another 1500. We have these last, this last, and we have a, a whole run of these Duncans that we never ever ever get to see. Uh, and some of them die natural deaths, I think, not too many. <laughs> I think quite a lot of them in the God Emperor's time, up to the point of God Emperor, get killed by the God Emperor. Um, and he remembers an awful lot of his deaths, you know. So the last Duncan in Idaho, where we were going with that, the, the other memory. His personal other memory, and um, these different threads. We're talking about just in terms of going to be the face dancers as well, and all sorts of things. Some of these would have been maybe red herring. Some of them would be definitely have wrapped up. And I, I like to think that within me, looking at this guys, I don't know what you think the level of interconnectivity of these different things within the June series is really important to Frank. It's an absolute deliberate. I'm going to do this this way. Um, so I part of me thinks that what I'm just identifying what are the mysteries, what's not, what do we not know at the end of Chapter House June I think the worms are a big mystery to be answered and I think they've got something possibly to do with Daniel and Marty and what's going on with Duncan and why, you know, the, the mystery of how he's able to see this and that everything that he's looking at is actually a, a metaphor presented by his mind because his brain can't quite figure out what it is he's looking at so you know the reveal of daniel and marty is probably the reality of daniel and marty behind that metaphor 
and we would assume maybe that Duncan's final crisis point would involve being able to break through that barrier and to kind of understand who they are and what they are in reality rather than his, his brain representing them as some kind of, uh, my brain can't deal with this, so here's a metaphor of, of a pair of gardeners, an old couple, and you know, I said I always think of them looking like um, the, the couple from the painting American Gothic. Hi, Lily. Um, Lily says, I read somewhere that it was actually the fans' interest in the Duncan character that persuaded Herbert to bring him back. Um, yeah, I, be I believe that's correct. Um, not sure if we'll get a source for it, but um, yeah, and I think it's the same with um, the Baron. Um, and, and, I, and I think, but the, the Duncan was definitely he talked about being on the, a firm favorite. Um, I don't think he initially, but, but yeah, I don't think he initially planned to bring him back, but I, I'm pretty sure it was to do with the fans. Um, it, it's interesting within the just the fan community of June and so on, but early in the days, we, we talk about the the the, the June um, encyclopedia by Professor Willis E. McNally, and um, that's actually a work of fan fiction. Uh, and you know, published this incredible work of fan fiction, real, you know, proper, you know, and um, hmm. so you know, Fra Frank's response to fans, I think, is pretty positive, and, uh, and um, I mean, he absolutely loved that, uh, and really enjoyed the whole. Totally, there, there's been there's an interview with Frank and Bev and. Uh, uh, well, I see McNally online. I think you can get the transcripts. It's about an hour and a half of them having a chat, and um, yeah, I think I think uh, Well, I see McNally actually delivered the the eulogy for Frank Herbert. Um, hmm. So yeah, his, his response to fans that is pretty good. Duncan is is brought back. I'm I'm pretty sure, as you say, because of fan interest, and I think it just Duncan's really underused in June. And he is an interesting character. Um, Gurney Halleck, she's a lot better. Um, but that's obviously because Duncan's... To, <laughs> not, oops, maybe a spoiler alert. But uh, lots and lots of Duncan's to come. Um, Scott Wells. Hi, Scott. Would say, I think Clareby being cyborg would have some future implications. Clareby. I'm not sure. Hang on. Do, 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 do. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Is that is that to do with uh, the new books, the, the Brian Herbert ones? trying to uh, Claire B. Sorry, Scott, we've got a context that might help me give you a wee bit of a better uh, response. Um, Brad Rose says, do you have any speculation on where the worms come from? Uh, the worm spice chicken egg thing is interesting and a tad sad we will never know what Frank's vision was. Um, based on what we were just chatting, I was, yeah, I've been speculating on that a wee bit recently and I never put too much thought into it. I know we know that they're an outside vector. Uh, we know that they're plant and animal hybrid and that they're probably genetically engineered. Um, <laughs> sorry, Caron. <laughs> uh, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Um, <laughs> the answer is the egg, uh, by the way, if you want to know. Uh, the thing that laid the egg wasn't a chicken, but what came out of the egg was. So uh, that's one of those questions that actually has an answer <laughs> um but yeah brad absolutely i think i think um hmm. my money's earth i think and earth's mentioned so little in the june universe and that, yeah that's just my guess um hmm I don't. Yeah, I think Earth is just mentioned once in the June universe, and that's it. But they've, they're an outside species. They're brought to the planet. They, you know, they don't fly ships or anything themselves. Somebody brought them there, and because, of, particularly because of the nature, and they're just one of those things that they have. They, so they must have come from a. I don't know. You, you get the sense that they mustn't. Have, they must have come from a planet that had water. But again, that, that's what they do. They turn planets into desert. What's the point of a worm? And if it is engineered, well, surely it's to desertify a planet. But also, if they have been engineered, then the whole thing about Melange is, is the end product, if you like. So uh, the worms, the whole worm things, I, I've, I've done a whole life cycle of the worms and everything, but where do they come from and what are they is a big mystery. Um, but yeah, so as, a, as, a, as an educated guess, and that's all, Brad, 
uh, we could have all sorts of possibilities here. But I'd go with Earth. I think it's the only. I think that if they were created on Earth, and what you know, where what's happened to Earth, nobody seems to. It's the Empire of a Thousand Worlds, but nobody really seems to pay much attention to it. So, um, there we go. I don't know if I, I don't know what you think, but that, it's it's just a it's just a guess. Um, but as you say, a tad sad that we'll never know what Frank's vision was. I, I agree. Chris says we've been left wishing that there'd be an eighth book. Thanks again for your work you've done here. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you never know. Uh, Frank, if Frank was in good health, he would probably need to sell books. He probably would have run on things, you know. The Benny Jesuit chauffeur. <laughs> That's Claire B. Sorry. <laughs> right, Scott, catching up. We. Sorry, yes, Carl is sp spoiling something for you there. I think. <laughs> Worm is a doomsday weapon. Yeah, well, an environmental weapon or invasive species. Um, yeah, why not? Uh, I think it's uh, yeah. We, we, whenever we get to the ecology section on these videos, Lily, you'll see how you know, we talk about the cane toad in in, um, in Australia as an introduced species and how utterly destructive it is. So yeah, you, you could use a you could use a you could use a species as a weapon, particularly well, particularly against crops and things. Um, mm. It's a possibility. Maybe, maybe there was a good intent. I suppose we were talking about man, mankind's need for, you know, super psychotropic, <laughs> bad drugs that, that prevent you from, you know, they stop you. Milan stops you from getting old, basically, doesn't it? So it's, um, it's the withdrawal that kind of makes you like, uh, instantly age and stuff, isn't it? And kills you. There's a drug in a drug in um, is it a drug in Ju Judge Dredd called Stucky Stucky glands? I think that. Uh, Whenever you withdraw, they, it's a youth drug, and as soon as you withdraw, you instantly age on with it. You know. Carol says, "I imagine June seven would have had a Daniel and Marty get killed off screen and a side note twenty percent into the book. It could well he does that a lot, doesn't he? Karen? There's there's always action that happens off screen. Not so easy if you say chicken egg does a chicken egg come from a chicken or does a chicken come from a chicken egg semantics. <laughs> well, the thing that laid the egg." I suppose the, the chicken is the mutation of the creature that laid that egg. Uh, that's the way I look at it. So the animal that laid the egg, so that egg, I suppose, you know, that's not a chicken. But in terms of what's inside that egg is a mutation of that animal that we call a chicken, and that's your first chicken. It's, what, uh, it's, it's one of those, you know, uh, if something falls in the woods and nobody's around to hear it, does it make, does, you know, if a tree falls in the woods and nobody's around to hear it, does it make a sound? Yes. <laughs> but uh suppose maybe the glass empty, glass glass full. And and those are not the only two options. <laughs> oh, you're all right, Brad, don't be worried. It's just one of those fun things. It is a, it is pretty much a semant semantics problem. But it, it, there's logic to it as well, I think. Um but who you know, way back in time. Chickens, chickens are great fun. <laughs> I think chick I love problems like that. Chicken and the egg, these kind of things, they're great. Um, hmm. Just trying to think. There's another obvious one as well. Oh, um, I suppose we all, we all think about what hand, what what direction do the hands go on a clock? You know, we we'd all say clockwise, uh, and they don't. They move anti-clockwise. <laughs> uh, simply, you know, if you're the clock, doom, 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 you know, you're moving anti-clockwise. Clocks turn around, it's facing. You. So there. <laughs> There you go. Little things like that, I think they're good and fun, you know. But not to worry, not to worry, Brad. Just a bit of a giggle. Uh, but yeah, what worms possibly is a doomsday weapon, and I think that just the mystery around the worms is the one that we, we, we that we focus on the the mystery of the worms and the spice. And there is a bit about capturing worms. Can we transplant them? The, the the nature of the worms is all kind of really to do with where did they originally come from and what did they do to their home world or why were they transplanted and as somebody mentioned there earlier, the idea that Daniel and Marty are, are gardeners you know um, maybe, there, maybe there is, I always think that the mystery of the worms would, have, would, would require a bit of payoff and I think about, we talk about no ships no globes and, and the other day we said about how you learn from what what's not there does that make sense we, we, I, we talked about that wee poem I went, I went to the mountain the other day to see the wise man he was not there. I learned many things. So if you think about what do you not see in June, 
you don't see earth <laughs> if you see what i mean yes they do <laughs> it just depends on if you it's a relativity pro, pro thing isn't it if you're the clock if you are the clock your hands move anti-clockwise you can do it yourself oh uh, yeah there we go but if, if if you're looking at the clock they appear to move it depends on if you're the clock or not uh but isn't, isn't that what they say about in australia about the water going around the you know uh i think again it's just whatever direction you force the water is, <laughs> is the direction it'll go um one of those things i know but they're they're fun fun things like that uh, uh there, there's a great um somebody who's really good for all those kind of logic problems folks if you like those things is, is raymond Smollyan, who i think passed away recently but um he has an online book if you want if you want a free book i find it online a pdf it's called um if you can't remember the name of this book this is what it's called the book is called what is the name of this book <laughs> and it's logic is it, is it this uh, i don't can't remember it's the story of dracula and other logic problems by Raymond Smolian. and um it's a cracking read it's got loads i use them with my students really to to, to sort of uh kind of reprogram their thinking into not trusting questions you know um they're, they're they're very very good uh <laughs> good fun you probably know a lot of them they're quite famous these days hmm. well there we go well listen folks i'll tell you what um chicken and the egg and all that stuff um but i'll tell you what we'll wrap up for tonight thank you very much for joining us and um that was that was the end just just to wrap up i'll tell you that was the end of our look at the whole thing there is on the theme of evolution and we've been breaking it up into, into bite size really to deal with how the June universe evolves, how, how technology evolves and groups of people. Then we looked at individuals and then we've, we've actually kind of looked through the Kwisatz Satirites. So that's been the common thread there. We're going to be returning to a bunch of these topics again, but this time we're going to really be having a look at, um, from, from tomorrow we're going to set up another big setup for you. Frank Herbert's Attack on the Hero. It's going to be quite a, a much bigger episode and this is setting up the whole, the whole look at the hero. <coughs> from Frank Herbert's point of view, as a deliberate attack against the science fiction hero. Uh, Travis says, hello from the USA. Love your videos. Thanks for your great insight into the June series. Oh, you're very welcome, Travis. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're just wrapping up a wee bit at the minute, but uh, we're here every night from just after 10. Good night, David. And thanks so much, says Sean, as always. Thanks, guys. So tomorrow we've got, tomorrow's got a good episode on the all things the hero within uh, the June universe and the June series. And it's really going to set up all your knowledge for the hero, uh, how Frank looks at it. And Frank approaches the hero in a particular way. But June is, is I think, three different attacks against heroes of different types. And it worked, again, the way June works on multiple levels. So the, the point of setting up all this with evolution and presenting a few of these guys here at the end is that evolution is a major conduit for his heroic story and to show us the dangers of these heroes and how these dangers can evolve and get worse and worse and worse and uh that that is the great thing about june he likes to sh he likes to show us these things and say it can get worse and i warned you <laughs> now let's have a look and see how worse how bad things can really get you know so i look forward to that we'll see you tomorrow folks at uh, 10 o'clock on the channel for the the opening introductory chapter on the hero in frank herbert's june series and then we'll be um you know, there's an awful lot in this coming it's a, it's my favorite part of the of the whole run of it and um we'll be going into the ancient world and the psychology psychoanalysis mythography and all of this stuff and really what what frank works with out of all of this kind of stuff in the june universe so um it's an interesting episode and um he, he frank herbert particularly favors certain mythographers and, and uh writers within a group his knowledge of mythography for example is not that not complete or comprehensive um but it works on a lot of different levels as usual and goodness knows what we'll end up talking about tomorrow night if you can join me but in the meantime um thank you very much as always it's it's great fun um we'll be doing these one a night uh, all the way up until the movie comes out and uh once that's done we'll be definitely trying to keep up these live broadcasts and, and we'll, we'll be fitting it in around june and science fiction in general we'll maybe do maybe do one or two a week and try possibly um we we, we went with 10 p.m gmt plus one here just really for for to keep it safe and nightly i suppose um for us to, to have a, a continual time each night 
But uh, what we'll possibly do whenever it comes to, uh, I know there's a movie coming out, Carol, <laughs> question mark. Uh, what we'll possibly do whenever uh, we do this run up until the 21st of October, when the movie comes out, Carol, is um, we'll maybe look into what, what, what times are best for doing these things and uh, what times and days. Because um, there is there's an international audience out there, and uh, I'm over here stuck in. Uh, I don't think I have too many viewers in the UK, to be honest. We have a lot of people from all over the place, you know. So um, there we go, and it's nice to meet you all. And, uh, thank you very much, as always, for joining me. And I'll wind up and say thanks a lot. Keep yourselves safe. Look after yourselves. And uh, thanks very much again. And good night, folks. Take care. <laughs> Of course, there's a movie. <laughs> All the very best, folks. Good night. Do, 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 do.